Thank you, James, for the kind introduction. It's a wonderful, uh, it's a pleasure to present and share some work uh, with you here today. So I'm going to uh, guide you through a project where actually the ECM uh, plays a, a major role. You're going to see that in the in the following. Um, so in fact, I, I think as, oh, well, I guess as most of you, uh, we share this excitement for uh, actually this huge diversity that we see in biological systems. There's a huge diversity in shape and in form. And it's a, a really a fascinating question to understand how these differences in shape and form are actually controlled on a molecular and on a conceptual level. Now, uh, since over 100 years now, uh, in the beautiful uh, work from Darcy Thompson on growth and form, uh, Darcy Thompson speculated or actually laid the basis for the fact that growth and form are inherently linked by physical laws. And what he suggested in the last chapter of his book, uh, which was called On the Theory of Transformations, is that uh, related structures, morphologically related structures, could be transformed by simple mathematical operations. So what you see here is the uh, back is the carcasses of different crab species overlaid by a grid, and you can nicely see that if you transform this grid, if you actually uh, stress it, if you shear it or deform it, you can uh, create as from a, an original shape, you can transform that into a, a relatively uh, related shape. Of course, that uh, at that time, it was unclear what might be this uh, transformations, but uh, already back then, Darcy Thompson speculated that these variations might be due to, <clears throat> might be due to actual differences in growth patterns. Now, uh, roughly 100 years later, we have a lot of examples that actually show how differences in tissue growth can actively drive morphological changes. What I'm going to show you here is, I think, one of the most uh, beautiful and, and visual examples, which is the example of the chicken gut looping. So if you dissect the chicken, uh, the gut will be uh, compact and wiggly, but actually a skilled person can dissect the gut, which actually consists of two uh, tissues, the gut tube, and the mesentery. And you can see if you separate them, they are of completely different sizes. So that raises the question, how, how does that fit towards each other? So in fact, uh, the gut tube is much longer or much wider than the mesentery. So which uh, in fact is called the geometric incompatibility. These two structures don't uh, fit to each other. So to actually make them into one coherent structure, you need to take the mesentery, stretch it, sew it with the gut tube and upon release the structure is going to relax and form the uh, wiggly structure of the gut which comes at the cost of residual internal stress in the structure so uh, one thing i want to highlight is that actually the uh, form that we observe in biological structures is always a result of growth or um, one can even say the growth history of a structure and actual deformation obeying the laws of physics now, uh, there's a lot of differences these days, how actually these growth associated mechanical instabilities can drive different morphologies. So not only the looping of the gut, but also the actual inner surface, the villi of the gut depend on such a mechanical instability, as well as cortex folding or uh, bending in plants. Now, the examples I'm showing you here in the end, they uh, function, they occur in rather complicated tissues. It's the uh, interplay, the mechanical interplay of different tissues. So uh, today I would like to actually revisit, uh, revisit this question of how growth induced stress can mechanically guide three dimensional shape, moving to a, a more simple system, trying to really go down to the basis how uh, this mechanical stress emerges during development. So the system I'm using is a very well known, very well studied for growth. It's the Drosophila wing imaginal disc. As you can see here, we can uh, cover that uh, by explants for a little more than two days. And actually the central portion of this uh, epithelium is called the wing pouch, which is going to give rise to the adult uh, wing blade of the fly during metamorphosis. Now, as you see, this structure grows tremendously. However, uh, so far growth has mostly been studied in 2D because in fact, the structure seems mostly flat. However, I'm sure you'll agree growth is a dynamic process and it's an intrinsically three-dimensional process. So what I actually did is I uh, segmented uh, wing disks in 3D to actually get volumetric information on growth. 
And you can see this uh, very stunning growth within a little more than two days, we actually get the growth of a little more than 65 fold, which is quite striking. And of course, this raises uh, the, um, uh, the, the logic question, to which extent this tremendous growth is associated with uh, changes in morphology. Now, if you look at a cross section of wing discs, so if you uh, cut a disc along a line, you turn it by 90 degrees, you look at the cut interface, uh, down here, you can nicely see that the disc starts off as a flat structure. However, during that growth period, the disc starts to bend upwards and form a dome. Associate with growth and doming, actually also the wing pouch epithelium is increasing in thickness. So during these two days, it's roughly a doubling in thickness. So uh, what I would like to understand is how growth and form referring to bending and thickening and of the, of the wing disc is actually linked. So how are these two things mechanically controlled? Um, now, given my introduction, uh, it is, of course, the, the most intuitive way to think about is maybe there is a difference in growth within the tissue that drives a mechanical instability. So a scenario would be that growth is non-uniform within the plane of the tissue. So, for example, that's the wing pouch uh, grows much more than the actual peripheral tissue surrounding it leading to compression. Um, then I have not mentioned actually the wing disc is a two layer. So the wing pouch epithelium is overlaid by the so-called peripodial epithelium. And one could imagine in a second scenario that this top epithelium grows much more than the actual wing pouch also introducing or leading to a bending. Now I have very carefully quantified growth by several means by ex vivo life imaging using mitotic markers or clonal assays. I'm not going into the details today, but uh, I have not found any evidence for non-uniformities in growth. So both of these scenarios do actually not account for the morphological changes we see. So it's not differential growth between tissue layers that accounts for uh, morphological changes in the wing disc which kept me uh, well quite dazzled for a moment until I actually realized, well, the wing disc is not only a two layer consisting of two epithelial tissues, but it's also covered by a basement membrane. It's encapsulated in a shell of collagen, as you can see here in green. So uh, basement membrane, I guess most of you have heard of basement membranes. They are a sheet like specialized extracellular matrices. They provide a structural support for epithelial tissues. You can imagine them kind of as fundament, like the fundament of a building. And I think what is very relevant is that the uh, stiffness of basement membranes is usually much higher than the stiffness or the Young's modulus of uh, cells. So I was hypothesizing that actually the basement membrane has a dominant role in these morphological changes. And in fact, uh, given that the disc is a four layer, I ask you for the rest of the presentation to ignore the two top layers because they are actually not relevant. We can explain the morphology of the disc exclusively with the bottom tissue layer and the bottom basement membrane. So the hypothesis would be that the uh, wing pouch tissue actually grows more or outgrows the bottom basement membrane, which, which uh, introduces bending and thickening of the tissue. So to get a conceptual insight into this, I teamed up with Alexander Ehrlich, who is in Grenoble now, and Giuseppe Pizzolo in Ireland. These are both theorists who have been creating a, a nonlinear elastic continuum model to uh, model the uh, shape changes based on the concept of morphoelasticity. So what morphoelasticity suggests is that an initial state, so a, a little uh, ungrown wing disc at three days, is going to be transformed into the observed state after five days, a domed wing disc. And this uh, process, this uh, growth process can be decomposed into an actual growth component described by a growth tensor and a deformation a component. So how you can envision that? Uh, if, you, uh, if you separate these two discs, the uh, basement membrane and the wing pouch, you let these two discs grow individually and now imagine the uh, tissue grows more, you will end up with two discs of uh, different sizes. They are not compatible anymore. Again, we have a geometric incompatibility. In order to merge these discs into a, into a coherent object, we need to introduce deformation. So we need to stretch the bottom ECM, glue it, and let it relax, which results, which is going to result in a, uh, in a deformation, which comes at the cost of residual stress. Now, how could we test such a model? Of course, we had this theoretical model. We wanted to experimentally challenge this. Uh, a very nice way that we thought of is 
actually the model suggests that the basement membrane layer is constraining the tissue. So if we could remove the basement membrane, we could remove the elastic component and move back to this kind of to this reference state, which actually suggests that the tissue should relax upon basement membrane uh, removal. So this is something that experimentally actually is quite simple. If you take a grown wing disc that is bent and has the basement membrane, you can incubate such a wing disc in collagenase, which is a well-known enzyme that digests collagen. So uh, we remove the collagen layer, the basement membrane layer, and you can see two things. First of all, the tissue flattens, you lose the dome. And second of all, you get the striking reduction in tissue thickness. So this clearly shows that the basement membrane is a crucial component for tissue bending and thickening. <clears throat> now, uh, having, this, uh, having established this uh, context that we can remove the elastic component by removal of the basement membrane, we can now actually understand how the tissue grows by comparing the initial state with the configuration of the, at the reference state. So we can learn something of the directionality of growth. So for this, we have to compare at different time points. So what I did, I was looking at discs at two and a half, three and four days. I was incubating them in collagenase to remove the basement membrane. And you can nicely see two things. Again, they all flatten out. But interestingly, the relaxed tissue thickness remains constant. So at four days, the relaxed thickness is very similar to the relaxed thickness at two days. There's no active change in thickness. So what does that mean? This actually means that the tissue layer follows Unisotro uh, unisotropic planar growth. So mass is only added along the x, y axis, but there's no active growth in, th in thickness. So this was a very nice observation because uh, by this, we could parameterize our model. We could completely describe the growth of the tissue because we knew the magnitude. So the overall increase in growth, which is 65 fold. And we knew the anisotropy, the direction of growth, which is planar. Of course, this raises now the question, how about the uh, basement membrane? So uh, we first check the magnitude of basement membrane growth. In fact, uh, I'm not going to show you the experimental results. Uh, I just show you the results. And in fact, what we found is that the basement membrane actually gr just grows 15% less than the tissue. So it's not a striking different in, difference in growth. And if we feed such a difference into our, uh, into our model, assuming planar growth for both layers, you can nicely see that we end up with some kind of a banana structure, but that looks quite different from the actual shape of a wing disc. So we are missing something. We knew we were missing something. Uh, and as you can guess, this most likely is the anisotropy of basement membrane growth. So again, to learn something about the anisotropy of basement membrane growth, it would be nice to remove the elastic deformation component. So in this case, we would like to remove the actual tissue layer to look at the relaxed basement membrane layer. So also, this is something that actually one can do quite, uh, quite easily. If you take a wing disc, a grown wing disc, well bent with the basement membrane, you can uh, incubate such an explant in detergents. So detergents are chemicals that we well we use every day in labs in, in the lab now. Detergent uh, interacts with the lipid bilayer; it pokes holes in the cells, which actually results in the loss of the uh, cellular uh, uh, in the cellular pressure. So you can nicely see that upon incubation with the detergent, the uh, the disc uh, the the tissue actually uh, disappears and the basement membrane starts to relax. So uh, the obvious question is, how does the, or does the relaxed thickness of the basement membrane change along the trajectory of development? So again, uh, I was looking at samples at different development time points, three, four, five days. I took these discs, I removed the cells by incubation in detergent, and I'm observing the relaxed configuration of the basement membrane. And I hope what you can very well appreciate is in the case of the basement membrane, actually, there is a tremendous increase in thickness. So the basement membrane actually uh, becomes thicker during development. What does that mean for its growth properties? Actually, the basement membrane follows non-planar 3D growth. So uh, a certain part of the newly added basement membrane is deposited along the z-axis. So there's active thickness growth. And hence, there is a lesser amount of material added along the x, y axis in plane. OK, so with this, we could completely parameterize our model. And uh, conceptually, what does that mean? So I showed you that the tissue follows planar growth. So we get a disk of a certain size. Now, the basement membrane actually grows 15% less. And I showed you if we assume planar growth, 
Well, the disk is still large enough, so the geometric incompatibility is not big enough to actually introduce enough, uh, enough physical stress. However, considering now that we know it's actually non-planar 3D growth that the basement membrane follows, so more material is deposited along the z-axis and to a lesser extent along the xy-axis, we actually end up with a disk of a smaller size. So we're increasing the geometric incompatibility and thereby we are increasing the need for elastic deformation. Now, if we put these parameters in our very simple uh, <clears throat> nonlinear elastic model, uh, we can very well recapitulate the uh, overall development of disk doming. So up here, you see the model predictions from uh, three to five days. And you can nicely appreciate that with the doming, the basement membrane slowly accumulates stress and becomes under tension. Furthermore, the model can also very well predict the thickening of the uh, wing pouch tissue over the two days. And we can also predict the actual thickness of the basement membrane. So in other words, uh, this, this very simple model of differential growth and isotropy between a tissue layer and the basement membrane can, in the case of the wing disc, very closely uh, or re re relatively precisely predict the overall morphology of the uh, growing tissue. So uh, with this, I'd like to conclude. What I have shown you is that in the case of the wing disc, the basement membrane acts as a growing and elastic constraint, absolutely essential for morphology. And here, I would really like to, uh, to highlight the growth aspect. So uh, very often, we, we perceive the basement membrane as kind of a passive uh, constraint, a passive hindrance. But what uh, I have been showing is that this is really a growing constraint. And it's the growth properties, the differences in the anisotropy between the tissue and the basement membrane that determines the uh, morphology. So it's the fact that the tissue grows in 2D and the basement membrane actually follows non-planar 3D growth. Now, I have not shown you this for time reasons, but actually we do know the modulators that cells produce to actively being able to modulate the growth properties of the basement membrane. So cells have the capacity to control this uh, non-planar 3D growth of the basement membrane. And uh, just to come back to how I started, I think what I'm showing you here is a very simple growth law that I think goes very well along the, uh, the conceptual ideas that Tarsi Thompson proposed over 100 years ago. And uh, I think it is nice to see that a complex biological phenomenon can be explained by rather simple mathematics uh, in this case here. So with this, uh, I would like to end. Well, I, of course, I would like to uh, thank Thomas for having me in his team. It's a very stimulating atmosphere, all the team members. A uh, particular thank to Alexander and Giuseppe, who have been pushing the theory sides for a lot of exciting discussions. Um, and of course, my funding. And finally, uh, thank you for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Great. Thank you very much, Stefan. So again, any questions, please put them in the uh, Q&A. Um, we have a couple from, uh, we have a first question from Stefania. Um, she says, fantastic talk. Could you also remove only the bottom basal membrane, e.g. using a laser to cut it, to see the contribution on the tissue shape of having basal membrane all around? Mm -hmm. Yeah, excellent question. Uh, uh, I have not done that yet, but we can actually do that genetically. Uh, we can do that by genetically overexpressing a basement membrane modifier like uh, matrix metalloproteinases. This is something that is ongoing, but given the mechanic uh, evaluation that I have been doing, I think it is very clear that it's the bottom basement membrane that is crucial, while the top basement membrane that I have not been talking about is actually mechanically not relevant for the uh, morphology of the disc. Thank you. Uh, we've got a question from Julia Begamini. Begamini. Uh, thank you for the nice talk. Uh, maybe I uh, missed it. Did you somehow test the biological effects of geometric perturbation? So, uh, well, I'm not sure if I get the, the question right, but uh, these perturbations that I have been showing, they're all acute perturbations. So this means uh, in case of collagenase, we remove the basement membrane and I fix and observe the tissue actually after actually two minutes of incubation. So it's, it's very acute removal. 
I have not really gone into the long-term effect of uh, modifying the mechanics of the disk and observing the effect on actual morphology, uh, downstream signaling effects. So this is something for a future work, yes. Thank you. And Catherine Brown is asking, does the basal area of the cells decrease during doming as the tissue thickens? And does this have any impact on the growth of the basement membrane? So uh, first part of the answer, yes. We do know that during this doming process, cells actually start out as being uh, cuboidal and parallel. And during the doming process, they start forming a wedge shape and the basal surface actively, I mean, it, the basal surface decreases. Um, to which extent the cells actively modulate the basement membrane is not, clear, is not yet clear. Uh, I think there is evidence that uh, DPP signaling, so BMP signaling, which is uh, graded in the disc proper tissue, is required for instructing basement membrane properties. But how DPP directly relates to modifications in the basement membrane is something that is uh, that needs further investigation. And in the uh, collagenase experiment, where you remove the basement membrane, do you recover the more cubudal cub uh, shape of the um, the, the basal? Yes, so. absolutely, absolutely. So uh, cells become uh, become parallel again. They look yeah. so their their basal surface opens up, and yeah. uh, given that the height decreases, no cells become logically more cuboidal than uh, than they have been before. Yes. Yeah. Indeed. Um, and Alex Eve is asking, related to one of your last points, mm -hmm. is there any feedback or relationship between cells under mechanical stress and ECM secretion? For example, do the stretched cells secrete more basement membrane components or are these independent processes? So it's a wonderful question. And if I, I mean, if during my scientific career, I'll be able to uh, provide an answer to this, I would be very happy and satisfied. But this mechanical interplay between uh, perceiving the mechanical environment and cells responding to these mechanical cues and then actively remodeling their mechanical environment is a, well, as you can imagine, a very complicated question. And I really hope that we're going to progress in the next couple of years onto that question. Uh, and what what determines the thickness of the basement membrane? So mm -hmm. why why does it get thicker rather than just spread out? Excellent, excellent question. So I have no solid proof onto that, but uh, what my hypothesis is that we are actually having a layering here. So uh, we know that in so I have not gone into that, but we know that for the top basement membrane, which does not increase in thickness during development. It that this this uh, this maintaining a, a planar growth requires a mem basement membrane turnover, so it requires a, a matrix metalloproteinases. While these are actually downregulated in the disc proper, and my speculation is that a reduced turnover allows less expansion along the XY plane, and hence necessitates the addition of new uh, collagen molecules uh, along the Z axis, which results in adding additional layers, and hence. Uh, of course, also increasing the stiffness of the of the basement membrane during development. 